Hi, my friends. My name is Jeremy Siskin. I'm the author of a bunch of books, but today we're going to be talking about something that's in playing solo jazz piano, and actually specifically it's in the second edition, um, which is available everywhere now. If you happen to have ordered the first edition, I've made it uh, pay what you want on my website to get to the second, uh, the new material in the second edition, which has uh, this kind of new little couple of chapters, as well as audio examples and video examples for everything in the book. Okay, so what I want to talk about is like where I would suggest starting if you want to play kind of medium swing jazz standards um, as a solo pianist. I think this is uh, a question I get asked a lot. And sometimes my answer is you might need some skills that you get from playing from, with a group first before you approach playing solo jazz piano. Um, but I know sometimes that's not an option. Sometimes people really aren't interested in doing that. So here's my best answer as to where you would start in terms of voices. Um, okay, so this is in the Roman numeral uh, ch chapter B, Roman numeral 15 from uh, playing solo jazz piano second edition. We're going to start here with example B3. So these are what I call two note bass shells. Okay, and how this is going to work is that you're going to have the root of the chord plus the third or the seventh. You might know from other studies that um, when you have the third of the voicing lowest, we call that a type A. And when you have the seventh of the voicing lowest, we call that a type B. Okay, so these are going to have the root plus the third or the seventh in there. So um, the type A are here. These have the root plus the third. But notice that there's two different formations you can use. You could either have the third, just literally a third above the root, right? Or you could put that up an octave and play the third a tenth above the root. Now, I know some of you hate tenths. I always get comments on my videos. Tenths make me angry. <laughs> um, and so if you're a person who tenths make angry, uh, first of all, I'm sorry. I don't know who hurt you. Um, <laughs> I get it. Uh, I don't have the biggest hands in the world. I can't play all the tenths. Um, but you can always break tenths. Um, I'll let you see exactly what I'm doing with my hand. I'm you know, spreading my hand just as far as I can, and then right, this one, I can't reach that cleanly. Ugh. So I do something like that. And let's just take a second and pause and ask, well, why would I ever play a tenth when a third is so much easier? The answer is that the uh, everything has a certain range that it likes to be on on the piano and in music in general. You know, even if we were changing instruments, these principles would stay the same. And the basic ranges that we want to think about, and I'm going to switch views here, is that our third and our seventh like to be right here in what I call the magic range. This goes from middle C, like, uh, sorry, this goes from an octave below middle C, what you could call C3, to about a fifth above middle C, right? Between these two notes. So we like to keep our third and our seventh roughly between those two notes, okay? So even in these examples that I've given, you could see that some of these are going a little too low. Okay. They're starting to sound a little gritty, a little muddy, not necessarily their best. The bass note, we like to put as low as possible, right? We're going to, like, sound is like a pyramid, so we want a wide bass. Um, and the lower the bass, the wider the bass, the more we can build a really harmonious sound above. So, you know, there's not a specific range for the bass, but it's going to kind of stop sounding like a bass note about where we start wanting our third and seventh. So above this C, it's going to stop sounding like a bass and it's going to sound like just kind of another part of the chord. So that means if we have something like a G7, this is right on the borderline. It's just a little bit below our range, but it's going to sound better if we can space it out, right? If we have something like this E minor 7, this is really below our range, right? So we could put it up here or we could space it up, all right? So having those tenths available to you, even if you can't play them simultaneously, even if you have to kind of roll them or uh, play them 
in one before the other, that's going to really help um, you have more options as to where you put your chords. Now, the type Bs require really no explanation. It's just always going to be the root and the seventh. Notice that these do not sound harmonious, <laughs> right? Um, and oftentimes the sevenths are going to resolve somewhere. They're either going to resolve in a, in a progression, or we might make the seventh resolve down to the sixth if we want something to really feel relaxed. Okay. Uh, but having, yeah, when I play three sevenths in a row like that, it doesn't sound that great. Okay. So these are going to be your main two formulas, the root plus the third type A, the root plus the seventh type B. Okay. Now, Whenever we have chords moving in the circle of fifths, which includes a two, five, one progression, right? D to G to C is moving in the circle of fifths. What we want to do is alternate between type A and B voicings, right? So this is A, B, A. This is root third. D is the root. F is the third. This is root seventh. G is the root of G seven. F is the seventh of G seven. C is the root. E is the third. I think I said thrid because I am a professional speller. Okay. And why do we want to alternate? Why couldn't we just do all type A? Well, we're going, uh, sorry, we want to make this top line move smoothly and we want to have these tenth note resolves. Oof. We want to have the tenths notes resolve. <laughs> cool. I'm doing great. No problems here. Um, Remember, we said those sevenths are tenths. They want to go somewhere. When we have it arranged in this way, then those notes can resolve. Uh, it also doesn't hurt that you know we can play them really close by. Watch my hand as I play this. Um, I'll make it really big. Okay, you can't see it. I, I would play it an octave below, but just so that you could see it. Look, my hand doesn't really have to move at all. Notice I'm not going. That's way too much movement. I'm just doing it in that nice, simple way. Okay, and then back here, so that was A, B, A. We could also go B, A, B, right? We're alternating. Doesn't matter if we start our A on A or on B. Um, and here I use a tenth for the type A, but it could be just a third. But you can see that now the bass is not really in a bass range anymore if we use that third. See again that we have what we call good voice leading, right? Really smooth. The tense notes are resolving. Okay. Okay, and watch how I play this one. I'll do it. Uh, oops, sorry. I meant to do that. I'll do it again an octave up. Okay, so I'm really stretching here. Uh, let me show you if we were in F major. Yeah, if you can't reach it, that's totally cool. It's all good. Okay, do your best. Um, one other element, and this is just kind of an aside, but it's totally cool if you can't reach the 10th cleanly. Like for me, I'll give you an example. For E flat, I can't reach. Ah, like I couldn't reach all the way from E flat to G, but I'm close enough that if I play both F and G with my flat thumb, I can do it without stretching too badly. And so that's allowed if you have two white keys or two black keys in a row, you can play them both with your thumb and you'll create a three note voicing, which is just a little bit more color. Now, of course, it has to be the appropriate notes for the chords, uh, but that's a little hack that I can share with you. Um, okay. So now let's see how this is going to work uh, for Beautiful Love. Great. So here's the lead sheet for Beautiful Love. Um, if you never heard this tune. Okay. So it starts with some two five ones. And I'm going to use these two note bass shells. So I'm going to use a type A. Right, that's the root and the third for E half diminished. Then a type B, that's the root and the seventh for A7. 
and then back to a type A. Remember, we're gonna alternate A, B, A when we're moving the circle of fifths. Cool, cool enough. And then, I could start the next one because we're actually still moving in the circle of fifths, right? We're going E, A, D, G. So I could keep alternating. We went A, B, A, and then we could go B, right? Root and seventh for G minor, root and third for C7, root and seventh for F major. And I might choose to resolve that to the sixth so it's not tense anymore. So let's hear how all that sounds together. Uh, I didn't do it right. All right. Let me do that one more time with a little better style. I apologize. the greatest arrangement you ever heard, but for your first step, it's pretty good. Now, you might be wondering, could I have started with a type B? And the answer is kind of. So if I were doing type B, I'd probably start up here. It works. For me, I don't like starting on type B because the bass is a little high. If I start an octave lower, the first note, the first chord is still within our range, but it kind of quickly goes too low. So type A is like right in the perfect zone in the middle of that magic range. So, right, for these next two chords, I can do exactly the same as the very first two chords of the piece. Type A, type B, back to type A. I could go back to type B. And now I'm on B flat seven, sharp 11. Now, I don't have to do anything about the sharp 11 in the chord because the sharp 11 is already in the melody. So I don't have to play it in the chord, it's in the melody. So I'm just gonna play the root in the seventh, my type B shell slide down to root in the seventh, my type B shell for A7. That really wants to resolve to D minor, right? Type B wants to resolve to type A. Gonna go again to type B, and then again A, B. So let's try this whole for 16 measures. I'm just using these two note shells. just these two note shells in the in the left hand
everybody. Thank you for watching. Um, if this was a lesson for you, I have two places to point you. You might, you know, you might enjoy the second edition of playing solo jazz piano. But if uh, this is like brand new information for you, Jazz Piano Fundamentals Book One might be a good place to get started to really get to know the jazz style and voicings. Thank you for watching. If you've watched this far, um, I have no good word for you, uh, but I'm thinking about my dog, so let's use the word uh, Frankie. That's my dog's name. All right, bye-bye.